rustling of pages just blesses my heart. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning as we read God's Word. Qualifications of an Overseer, chapter 3, verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires an overtask. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Not a drunkard, nor violent, but gentle, nor quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how God's, for if someone, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnations of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Lord, I pray that as we come this morning and we move forward as a church to license this man. Your chosen call. Lord, I pray that everything that is said and done, again, will bring honor and glory to you. Lord, I rebuke Satan in any form that he is trying to come into this service and draw the attention of the people who are here. But Lord, take the attention away from you in any way. Lord, I stand behind your cross. And Lord, I pray that it is not me that they would see or hear, but it is the Holy Spirit yearning in their heart that they would see or hear. And Lord, they will feel your touch and desire to do your bidding. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. I was reading those, and I want to tell you, it is for us to come today to license Anthony. As I see this, and I look at Anthony, and then I hear him sing, it was hard to read the Scripture because, Anthony, I'm not going to lie, I can see in your heart you truly believe what you were singing. And I got a little misty. I'm starting to find that as I get older, it doesn't take much, especially when the Holy Spirit is involved. But this morning as we come to a church and we come to a firm, the beginning process of a man being called, many would say, well, what is the need for this? What is the need for this? Well, we see all through God's Word where there has always been a need. We understand that God supplies every need that we have. We also understand that God gives direction and everything that we have. If you have your Bible still open, go to chapter 1. I want you to look, starting at verse number, um, verse number 6, chapter 1, verse number 6. It says, Certain persons, by swearing from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or things about which they may confidence assertions. See, there were many people that wanted to say, oh, I know the law, or the many people were saying, oh, I know exactly what Jesus, but they were going out there, and they were saying things that were heresy to what Jesus was proclaiming. They were going out there, and they were being false witnesses. They were giving false testimonies. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, they were being little devils, all to either propel their fame, all to either propel their power, or all to either propel the monetary status. Here we see Paul is coming to Timothy and he's saying, hey, you need to make sure that you're not one of these people. Make sure that you understand what God is calling you to do. He's telling these people that when you are doing something that you know is contrary to what God would call you to do, you are not only doing something that is vile to heaven and wrong to the people here on earth, but you are committing a sin against the foundation of what I have brought forth in my son, Jesus Christ. We don't have to look too far on the TV or listen to the radio or even go around and listen to other pastors all around the United States, and I'll be giving you an example of that come Easter time, of pastors who will get up and ones that will call themselves and they will take the title of pastor, and then they will say something that is absolutely contradictory to God's Word, and then the church will stand up and applaud because they have no idea. You want to know why they have no idea? I'm going to be real clear about this morning. They have no idea because, one, they're not studying at home. Two, and when they are studying at home, they're not trying to go deep. They read a few, a few verses and say, God, this is what I think this means to me. And then they say a prayer, and then they think they're done. 
If God said it to someone, he's going to say it to everyone. And God said there has to be discernment in the heart. That's the reason we have the Holy Spirit, so we can have that discernment. That's the whole reason he puts it in us and is dwelled in us. He's not only the Holy Comforter, but he's also the Holy Ghost with the Holy Righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. And the people are standing up and they're applauding this form of heresy because they don't do their Bible study at home. How do you know that I don't preach heresy every Sunday? And let's say the majority here says, well, we, we do our Bible study. What if you're sitting there saying, I don't know? You're never going to know if you don't study it, if you don't allow God to work on you through the Scriptures. We see here, he's telling Timothy, don't be like these men. You need to make sure that you're in prayer. You need to make sure that you're in your Bible. Well, I can understand that. He's going to be called an overseer. He's moving forward to be a minister and possible pastor someday. I can understand why that's so important for him. No, it's important for every one of God's called people. It's important for the body of Christ. You may not be in a pulpit on a Sunday or a Sunday night or a Wednesday, but sooner or later you will be called to witness for God. And how can you witness if you do not know? Do you know? If we go on down, we see in verse number 12 where Christ Jesus came to save sinners. And in verse number 12, it says, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus the Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. He judged me faithful. Paul here is saying that he sees that God has judged him faithful. He didn't say he saw him or judging him perfect. He didn't say that he saw them or judging him as righteous. He said he saw them as judging him as faithful to the service. If Jesus Christ came down right now and called you, would he see faithfulness in your life? Are you faithful to the Word? Are you faithful to God who sent his Son to die for you on the cross? Are you faithful, faithful to him in your speech? Let no, let no unworthy or unwholesome word come out of your mouth. Well, it's not that bad. Would you say it if Jesus was sitting right there next to you? Because I want to tell you, he's not sitting right there next to you. He's sitting right on the inside. He hears it and sees it and understands it long before you bring it out of this nasty mouth. He's there. He's saying, God sees me as faithful. And he's thanking Jesus. He's thanking him for his call. Here, Paul is opening his heart to his brother Timothy, and he's saying, I'm, I'm so thankful for this calling. Now, if you know the history of Paul, he was a murderer, he was a slanderer, but Jesus Christ came to him, said, why do you persecute me? And he became what we know as the day as the greatest disciple, the apostle, to ever walk on this planet. And he's thanking him for the calling. Have you accepted your calling? Every one of us in this room has got a calling for Jesus Christ. And it's more than just sitting on a pew once a week. It's more than just giving something in an offering plate. God saying that I need all of you. I don't want just some of you. I want all of you. When I got married to my wife, she said, I want all of you. And praise the Lord, the older I get, the more I'm giving her. She's getting, she's getting way more than she bargained for. It's because of her good cooking. But I pray that, I pray that something else that's inside of me so much more now than what it was when Jesus said, you are saved. See, I was a babe in Christ then, and in certain areas I still am because I'm still learning every day. Yes, your pastor still learns every day. I look into the Word every day. I can't go a day without hearing God's Word. I can't do it. I desire it. I would rather have that than any type of cake or donut or ice cream. I love being in this thing. I love being a part of this. I love the fact that God has seen me faithful and he has called me into the ministry. I can't live without Jesus. Amen. Can you? 
Or do you pick it up and say, well, it's just something I need to do. You know what? I don't need to love my wife. I want to love my wife. I don't need to get in this pulpit. I desire to get in this pulpit. I don't need to go reach the lost. My demand in God and my love for him propels me to go, but it'll never start if the foundation wasn't set long before I ever called myself pastor. It started when I first called myself a body of Christ, a Christian. My calling is stronger in the beginning, and God has propelled his call. Every one of you have been called and propelled to be more than what you are. Do you strive every day to be that way? So what is a ministry license? Today we're going to be giving one as a church. We're going to call him. We're going to confirm him. But exactly what is a ministry license? The licensing is the church tentative approval for a man to serve until he has proved himself qualified for ordination. What is ordination? Well, here's a snapshot. It's when a men who have been called and ordained gather together and they sit down at a table and they ask questions and they look for the Holy Spirit that is revelant in that man's life and then that man leaves and they get together and they discern exactly everything that happened in that room and they alone decide if this man is ready for the ministry or not. That is ordination. But as far as the licensing, it's when a church comes together and says, we have seen the work of Christ in this man. We have seen and understood his heart for his Lord. We as a church stand together. We understand that we want to be a part of this man's life. And we affirm as a body of Christ that we have seen the Holy Spirit dwelling, living, and being expounded in the life around him. That is the licensing. Well, is it biblical? Well, you see, Paul here is looking back in the Word, and he's saying, there's many out there, they just start spouting it. I went on a mission trip one time to Philadelphia. I went in, and I listened to a man preach about Cracker, cracker Jacks for 45 minutes. He preached on exactly what it was to have Cracker Jacks, the sweetness of the Cracker Jack, and the prize in the box of the Cracker Jack. But not once did he ever hold up his Bible. Not once did he ever give one scripture. Oh, he was funny. Oh, he was entertaining. All oh, the people in the pews were going, oh, praise the Lord. But not once outside of him saying Jesus Christ, was Jesus Christ ever propelled in a biblical way that he was called to do, which is that proclaiming the Lord. I sat there, and I chuckled, and I was hungry with my Bible. I went up to him afterwards, and I said, exactly, I said, where did you get your mentorship? I said, who invested in you? Oh, no one invested in me, brother. I just picked up the Bible one day, started telling stories, and now they're coming. He said, you didn't like it? You didn't think I was funny? I said, oh, no. I said, you were funny. I said, I had to pay $10 for a ticket. And I walked away. He said, brother, he said, I'm getting the feeling I'm not getting the whole story. I said, let me ask you a question, sir. I said, I am not here to judge you, but God says to rebuke that. We are called to be fruit inspectors. Oh, you're not supposed to judge. We're not supposed to judge the lost. But we are called to be fruit inspectors of the saved. We are called to rebuke those that call themselves Christians, yet we see them walk a different way. We are called to make sure that we stand beside them, not only rebuke them, but grab hold of them, mentor them, and take them to the next level. We are not only called to rebuke, but we are called to love, and we are called to disciple. You don't just get to do the rebuke and walk away. This man came to me, and he wanted more. And I said, I come to you with the love of Christ, and I'm telling you, you've got a great opportunity to preach to these 80 people every week. And if that is a testimony of your service to God, they're not getting Jesus. And he started crying. And he says, well, I don't get no help, and if I don't make them laugh, they won't come back. I said, you'd rather have 10 that want Jesus than 80,000 that just want to be entertained. Barnwell First Baptist Church, I'm not looking for a group. I'm looking for a church. 
This man said, well, what can I do? I said, well, you need to go back and get some schooling. You need to get under some mentorship. You need to get under a man that has proven himself. Don't look at the size of the church, but look at the size of the God in the man and allow him to invest in you. What does this have to do in license? When a church gets back together with Christ, we understand that when we as a church come and invest in this man through a licensing, we're telling him that we are investing in you. Anthony, First Baptist Church Barnwell is going to stand up today and they're going to take an oath to invest in you. Not because we're called to do it or not only because of that, but because we love you. In regard to the practice of granting a license for a minister, the following steps must be taken. The person to be licensed makes a public decision to the church and expresses his feeling that God is especially calling him into ministry. He has done so. He requests the church to grant him a license. He has done so. The church votes on the request to grant the license. It has so been done. And a certificate of license is filled out and presented to the minister. Depending on that vote, you'll get one today or not. <laughs> I believe that God is working all over you. So many people say, well, I don't need no license or ordination. It lets people who don't know you know that there's a body of believers out there that believe in you and trust you and gives you the right to stand in front of the pulpit and discern the word of God in front of them. I'm telling you, we need a lot of more discerning of God in the pulpit these days. Not just funniness, not just jokes, but I'm talking about God-fearing, holy Christ living, Jesus accepting, redemption, grace-believing, words of God to come from a pulpit and revive his body of Christ. The church needs revival. And I'm telling you, the church needs revival. I'm going to keep saying that till I hear this whole church say amen. The church needs revival. Amen. Not just Barnwell First Baptist, but every church body and believer in this world. If every church body and believer in this world would get together and understand what it means to have revival in their life, goodness gracious, Satan would have to go to Mars because there wouldn't be a place for him to hide on this planet. But that's okay. He's not going to be on this planet forever. He will be going to another place. And we ain't going with him. Well, we understand this and we believe in this. So why do we have a license? Why do we have a license? The Holy Scriptures require that some trial be previously made of those who are to be ordained to the ministry of the gospel. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 3. In order that this sacred office may be, not be granted or degraded, and that the churches in general association may have an opportunity for a better judgment respecting the gifts of those by whom they are to be instructed. For this purpose, candidates for ordination shall first be licensed to preach the gospel as an intern minister. So why do we have this license? We know that Anthony has been going and preaching the word for many years now. But now we are calling ourselves as a body of believers to come and start looking at him and start listening even closer. I've had the opportunity to listen to his sermons. I must admit you're a double whammy, Anthony. You can not only preach, but you can sing. I'm more of a one knockout kind of punch. You ask me to sing, they won't get into no preaching. Everybody in this room would leave. Or they'd be on YouTube in it. But Anthony, I've had the opportunity to listen to you preach. It was very important that you give me those CDs because I could not be here this morning doing this for you if I had not had the opportunity. The Holy Spirit is well with you and your family and your supportive wife. A licensed minister has the following authority. I want you to hear this. To preach the gospel whenever and wherever opportunity presents itself to conduct worship services, study groups, Bible studies, and other biblical classes needed as they may arise, to administer baptism and communion with the approval of the mentor or ordained minister when that minister requires that that will be me, your pastor, and to conduct funerals when required by their ministry. You 
all those who have been working in this capacity will now have a license from this church body for other church bodies to see that we are following you and we agree that you have these qualities. Not that you need our affirmation, but so the world can see that a body of Christ has come and through the affirmation of the Holy Spirit that works in you, we have seen it. You can go into this world and you can preach the gospel and you can change every to the other most ends hearts to increase the kingdom. That's what this means. When will ordination happen? That must be God calling. <laughs> the ordination will happen when we both know that God has called you into that ordination time. I do not believe that it is far off. I do not believe that it will take much time at all. There is a sadness in my heart as I do this because I am as thrilled as I am to license you today to the body of this church and to come with the ordination, I'm sure, which is just six to nine months away. With the prospect of losing you and your family to another church, saddens me deeply. But I know that God has got great things in store with you and your family. Verse number 15 in chapter 1, it says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. The Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the most foremost. There's not a person in this room today who is not a sinner. There's not a person in this room today that hasn't sinned before you walked into these steps. Let me tell you something. I, as a pastor... I sin just like you. I don't want to. I strive not to. And I promise you, Satan is on the outskirts of every day. He can't get too close to me because he knows he's going to get burned from the Holy Spirit. But he's constantly trying to remind me, you're not worthy of being in that pulpit. Don't you remember your past? Don't you remember what you said? Don't you remember when you were in the fire department or you owned your own business? Don't you remember when you were a power lifter, the things you said? Don't you remember the thoughts of your mind in the past? Don't you remember? And I always tell Satan, yes, I remember, but also my future is positive because Jesus Christ forgave me of the past and he's redeemed my future. Amen? Anthony, I'm here to tell you, don't you dare let Satan, the devil, the dirty one, remind you of an unworthy past for a righteous future that God has for you. He's going to tear you down. He'll use your wife. He'll use your kids. He'll use everyone around you unknowingly to them to try to pull you down, to weight you down. One day you'll have the title of senior pastor and the weight of everything that goes with it. But I promise you, it will be the most rewarding time of your life. If you listen to God, you follow his commands, you take heed to what people say, but you always follow the commands of God. And be the leader the Holy Spirit has destined you to be. For these, those of you who are here and here today, there's many of you that say, I can't do it because of my past. Stop living in your past. Stop living in the sin that you once had because Jesus, if you are saved, I'm talking to the ones in this room today that are saved. If you are saved, he has forgiven you. He has redeemed you. If you are saved, your future is promised. If you are saved, you have an ever lasting life and he has called you into the mission field to do something to be something to be around the something which is that of God the Holy Spirit Jesus Christ the Trinity all rolled in one you have the power inside of you I learned a long time ago people will bring you down if you let them but other people will bring you up if you let them. Listen to the encouraging and move forward with your life that God has given. Anthony, I encourage you to do that today. So then we get to the O's, the charges. Anthony, if you would, please come forward.
Please stand in front of the mic. 1 Timothy 8, verses 18 and 19, is demonstration of fight the good fight. Please respond after the charge by saying, I do. In verse number 18 of 1 Timothy, verses 18 and 19, it says, This charge I entrust in you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith in a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of the faith. Many have said that they're going to work for the Lord, and in the end, they have done nothing but destroy the kingdom around them. I charge you, Anthony Taylor, as was done by Paul and Timothy, that you would wage a good warfare. Hold on to your good faith and have a good conscience living by the whole word of God. Do you so accept? I do. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 is a call to pray for all people. It says in verse number 1, First of all, then I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. I charge you, Anthony Taylor, again as Paul did to Timothy, that you would pray for all people. I urge you to make constant supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving in all form for all people wherever God may lead. Do you so accept? I do. First Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Holy respect for the office of overseer that you feel and that we know the affirmation that God has called you for. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not a violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with the dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? We must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace or into the snare of the devil. I charge you, Anthony Taylor, as Paul charged Timothy to stay above reproach, be a biblical husband of one wife, sober-minded, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, nor a violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. You must manage your household well, keeping your children submissive, meaning well-behaved and teaching them God's Word. Anthony, I so charge, do you accept? I do. First Baptist Church Barnwell, would you please stand? Anthony, if you would, please turn around and face the church. First Baptist Church Barnwell, we have the cherished task of supporting this man and his family and allowing him to serve in different areas to minister to show his full calling to ministry. We have been called to love him, his wife, and his family. We are to pray often for Anthony and his ministry walk with the Lord. It is for us to show the world that through this licensing, we have seen his current walk of faith up to this date, and we, as a body of Christ, have seen his heart for Jesus. We are stating that we will do all the above and are willing through the license to let the world know we stand behind this man's call to the ministry. First Baptist Church Barnwell, if you do so accept, please say, Amen. Amen. If you guarantee that you will be praying for this man, I would like you to raise your hand so he could see his church family that will be praying and say, Amen. 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 Lord, I pray during this commissioning time of prayer that as we work towards the ordination to come, that you would allow him to experience every part of ministry over these next six to nine months. And Lord, that you would allow him to be encouraged, well taught. Lord, that he would be able to have an open eye to things he's never seen before and discernment in his heart on how to handle them. Lord, I pray that you would allow me as the mentor of this man, to be able to bring him in and show him things and allow him to have a full scene of what you're calling him in to do. Give him strength. 
Lord, we know that you've already given in the Spirit. And as with this prayer, I so commission Anthony Taylor as being licensed, voted on, and agreed to by the body of Christ as First Baptist Church of Barnwell. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Anthony, if you would, please come forward. First Baptist Church Barnwell, it was a great pleasure that I present to you your First Baptist Church licensing of Anthony Taylor. Amen. Give it a hug, brother. Yes, sir. God bless you, my friend. My teepee toes are taller than me. It's okay. I'm wider than you. So, <laughs> Brookie, if I could have you to come forward, please. And if I could get the chairman of the Deacons, please. You will get the certificate. Please come forward, both of you, to the pulpit. As your ministry begins, it's a great honor that I am able, well, actually, I'm not able, that Brookie will be presenting you this Bible from First Baptist Church of Barnwell. It is the number one selling Bible study in the world. And I know that you have a great, great testimony, and you have many books that you go to. But I pray that every time you use this Bible to preach and every time you use it to study, I pray that this Bible will remind you of a church family that loves you no matter where God calls you and that you always have a home. Brookie? <laughs> Chad? by the past. 